We pause briefly for station identification. This is the NBC television network. New pitcher on the mound for the Boston Red Sox, and he's a left-hander, Tony. Jim Burton on in relief of Rick Wise. Pretty much of a power pitcher. He throws a lot of fastballs. His fastball will tail into the left-handed hitters. He gets it down low. It'll sink. There was his curveball, that delivery. Doesn't change speeds too often. Give you a good shot of this one as he's warming up for the curve. If he can keep it in that spot when a hitter steps up to the plate. Pretty good pitch. How about four hits, three homers, and a triple? Not a bad slugging percentage, Kurt. Oh. Jim Burton is a rookie, brought up during the season. He's 26 years old on the 27th of October, and a Michigan native now making his home in Rochester, Michigan. Won a game, lost a couple with a 2.89 ERA for the Red Sox in 29 games. Now the Boston infield comes in with the Reds having already struck for two runs on back to back home runs. Pete Rose at third base with a triple, and there you see Ken Griffey stepping in to try and get Rose in with a fifth Cincinnati run. Left-hander against left-hander, and the fastball is up high. Pete Rose at third base. He hit one and hit it a ton to center field. Freddie Lynn really appeared to get an excellent jump on the ball, but the ball just going over his outstretched glove. Graham is giving a lot of signs down at third. Here's a 1-0 delivery, and that's high and outside. Two balls and no strikes on the Cincinnati right fielder, native of Denora, Pennsylvania, Ken Griffey. A lot of those signs, in fact, most of them are decoys. Gramis wants to put into the minds of the Red Sox that there's a possibility of a squeeze play. Burton pitching from the stretch. Griffey 0 for 2, a bouncing ball to second, a fly ball to center field. And he takes a strike at the letters from the left-hander Burton. Two and one. The Reds and the Red Sox splitting two at Fenway Park in Boston. Teon shutting out Cincinnati on five hits, six nothing Saturday. The Reds scoring two in the ninth inning Sunday. The score had come from behind, three to two win, and now trying to go up two to one in the third game of this 1975 World Series. Rose taking his edge off the back at third, and Griffey takes it high and inside as he backpedals away from the plate. Joe Morgan going back to the dugout to talk with manager Sparky Anderson. He's the on deck hitter. I wonder if he was reading a little bit uh, giving a little mini scouting report to Morgan as to what Burton throws. Three balls and one strike. Boston infield in with one out two runs across and Pete Rose occupying the third base bag. Burton with a pitch and Griffey is on with a walk. Tony, you talk about Sparky Anderson maybe giving Joe Morgan a bit of information concerning Jim Burton. And these two clubs, of course, scouted each other well. Ray Shore for Cincinnati, uh, the Red Super Scout, Frank Malzone, Eddie Casco, both seeing Cincinnati and a whole lot of them during the last month or so of the season. Joe Morgan standing in in a run-producing situation. He's had a couple of hits in nine times in this series, but 0 for 2 tonight with consecutive fly balls to center field. Uh, Petroselli playing about even with a bag and well off the line at third. Burleson and the second baseman Doyle a double play depth. Here's a throw to first base. Griffey not taking much of a lead to speak of. Burton not known to have a good move to first base and he's a little bit slow going to home. He's tall and lanky and many times it is a problem holding men on for a pitcher. Well, Jim Burton bound and determined to keep Griffey as close to the bag as he possibly can. Ken Griffey will run. He had three stolen bases in the league championship series sweep over Pittsburgh. That's right. I was about to point out they had 10 out of 10 against the Pirates. 10 stolen bases and 10 attempts. I'll make it three in a row that he's gone that way. Four to one the score Cincinnati over Boston the Red Sox spotting him a run or rather the Reds spotting him a run of the second on a Carlton Fisk homer and the Reds have played long ball three times to jump out in front four one. Burton nine Griffey at first base to the plate to Morgan swing and a miss 
Morgan went to hacking on the first pitch to the plate. The Red fans have had little to cheer about in World Series here in recent years. The Reds have lost five out of six games at Riverfront Stadium since the new ballpark was built. But tonight they're roaring every time they've got the shot. And they've had some. Burton after again throwing on to first base. Now looking down to Carlton Fisk as the Boston catcher hangs aside. Long look. One ball and one strike to Morgan. Marty, would you say, as we look at Pete Rose at third and Griffey at first, that Griffey has the best raw speed on this club? Oh, there's no question about it, Tony. And Joe Morgan will tell you that uh, himself. In a straightaway 100-yard dash, Joe, Ken Griffey will defeat anybody fairly easily on this club. Morgan out in front, two and one. He really hasn't learned the steal. He does most of it now in sheer speed, doesn't he? Joe Morgan constantly talked to him during the season of watching the opposing pitcher when you're in the dugout. Get involved in the game to that extent. That's the key to, to Joe Morgan's success. He's almost like a player coach in this team. He's amazing, Kurt. He has tremendous baseball knowledge, uh, easily conveys it. A lot of people think he'd be a great manager one day. Here's a fly ball hit well to right field. That ball is going to be a foul ball. Well, Dwight Evans could do nothing but watch that ball and hope that it stayed foul, which it did. Joe Morgan, uh, Sparky was telling me yesterday, he does not like men running off first base on him. He does with two strikes on a hitter. He gives him the okay. But he says it distracts his concentration. Burton back of the mound rubbing up the baseball and... Here we'll see that last line drive foul and see what the base runners do on this. Watch Rose with one out. He'll go back immediately to tag up in case the ball is caught. Griffey going about halfway, seeing whether it was going to be fair or not. Two and two, the count on Morgan. And now Burton has gone full to him. And that pitch right there is a pretty good example of the tremendous discipline this man has at the plate, although it was interesting to note when Sparky Anderson announced yesterday that he was moving Morgan back into the number three position that he'd be a little bit more reckless in that spot than he than he would be in the number two position and that he would go after pitches that normally he might not hit going at number two. An RBI spot, not a walk spot. Burton, before delivering the payoff pitch, again throws on to Cooper at first base. Good close up shot of the young rookie left hander Jim Burton for Boston. Morgan with a fly ball into straightaway center field. Now Rose tagging at third. Here's Lynn coming in to make the catch. Here's a throw to the plate, and it will not be in time. The Reds go out in front five to one. Sacrifice fly for Joe Morgan. As he picks up his first RBI in the 1975 World Series, the Reds now lead by four runs. And here's Tony Perez, who really seemed to provide the momentum for the Reds back in the last inning after drawing a two-odd walk, surprisingly stealing second base, and scoring ahead of Johnny Bench on Bench's home run. Now's the time to watch Ken Griffey with two outs. He wants to get in scoring position. Absolutely, Tony. You may well see him running. There he goes. High pitch down to second. No. The Reds are running and running at will right now in the Boston Red Sox. And with that stolen base. It's just no contest for Carlton Fisk. Griffey with a great jump and great speed. Carlton has no chance at all. This is their third stolen base. Perez, Foster, and now Griffey. Three stolen bases already, and Daryl Johnson's gone out to the mound. Tony, correct me if I'm wrong, but that did not appear to be a good pitch for Fist to throw on. It looked like an off-speed pitch. Looked like a hard-breaking ball. It's up in the strike zone, which is what a catcher prefers. It wasn't a good, no matter what he threw in that situation, it was just a great speed and a great jump by Griffey. He wasn't going to get thrown out. Well, the Red Sox are changing pitchers for the second time in the inning, so there's a break in the action here at Cincinnati with a score, Reds 5, Boston 1. 
Remember the World Series game four tomorrow night. Louis Tion for the Red Sox. Don Gullett for the Reds. Preceded by the baseball world of Joe Garagiola. Featuring Foster Brooks. And a different kind of baseball story. On NBC Sports. Number one in live coverage of major sports events all year round. And the Reds. With two in the fourth. Three in the fifth. Running wild now on the bases. Bring a right-hander in Cleveland to face Tony Perez. Reggie Cleveland inheriting a count from the departed Jim Burton. One and nothing the pitch that Ken Griffey stole second base on. 13 game winner for the Red Sox during the 1975 regular season. Two balls and no strikes to Perez. Cleveland might have been the most consistent pitcher on the Red Sox staff. From the end of July on through the season he was about 10 wins three losses. And Lott thought he would start the second game in Fenway Park because of his good championship series performance. Cleveland checking Griffey at second. Perez with a swing at a miss. It's two balls and one strike. Well, the reason they didn't was because of what we saw here today or tonight. And that is Wise, a high ball pitcher. They wanted a ground ball pitcher at Fenway. They wanted Wise to pitch in a bigger ballpark. Wise started the second playoff game against the Oakland A's, did not get a decision. <laughs> come back to get the count even against Perez at two and two. 13 wins nine losses for the Red Sox with a 443 earned run average he made 31 appearances with 20 starts. Reds today getting the kind of pitchers they seem to thrive on hard ballers hard fastball hard sliders not much off speed stuff. They wait for that fastball mm. don't they. They sure do. OK Cleveland cranking it up again as he checks second. Perez fouls it off to the right. But you know they, they talk about the Reds being a fastball hitting team. Any good hitting team has to be a good fastball hitting team. I remember those great Yankee teams you played on Tony. You fellas love that fastball. Any good hitting team does. We love Wilhelm's knuckleball. There's Ben. <laughs> There's Ben. <laughs> you ever score off him? <laughs> it's a no hitter against us. <laughs> now this Reds ball club led the majors in run production in 1975 and the Boston Red Sox were second. Full count to Tony Perez. Well, the Reds felt, Tony, they had an advantage possibly in the sense that Rick Wise and Reggie Cleveland, both former National League pitchers, and uh, most of the Reds hitters remember them from their years into this league. There's Kenny Griffey leading at second base here, two down in the inning. The Reds have struck for a trio and lead Boston 5-1 to one as we play baseball in the fifth inning. That's all for Tony Perez, and that's all for Cincinnati. A big inning, three runs across for the Reds here in the fifth, and at the end of five complete. Denny Doyle will open up the Boston Red Sox sixth inning, and the Red Sox, well, they're down by four runs. In this, the third game of the World Series, and the first of three straight nights of World Series action here in Cincinnati's Riverfront Stadium. Matt Darcy misses with a first pitch down low. And so far, the Red Sox, first three batters in the lineup have not reached base. That's right, Kurt. Cooper 0 for 3, Doyle 0 for 2 as he pops it foul, third base side, Rose and Concepcion, and Pete Rose loses it for the out. It has been tough all year long, and it will be tough again today for a team to come from behind with that great bullpen that Cincinnati has, and of course, Sparky uses it. He doesn't waste any time. None whatsoever, and this is the first uh, World Series appearance, of course, for right-hander Pat Darcy. Reds were almost invincible in this ballpark, winning 64 and losing only 17. That's not counting the wins that they had here against the Pittsburgh Pirates two straight in the National League Championship Series. Two balls and no strikes account on the left fielder Carl Yastrzemski. He's 0 for 2 and has hit ground balls both times, once to Morgan and once to Tony Perez. Yastrzemski now 2 for 9 in the World Series. Waiting Pat Darcy out as he comes with a fastball that goes to 3 and 0. On deck for the Boston Red Sox, catcher Carlton Fisk, who has accounted for the only Red Sox run with that homer back in the second. Fastball over on the 3 0 pitch. Darcy has not worked in a game since the 27th of September and then only two thirds of an inning in relief. Yaz is on with a one out walk. That ought to be enough 
for Sparky to get somebody going? Well, I'll tell you, Tony and Kurt. You're right. He, you're right. Absolutely <laughs> there goes right. The warm-up action. Yeah, Stremski gets a walk. Clay Carroll goes down to the Reds' bullpen to begin throwing for what will be the second time tonight. I don't blame him for the job that he got from his two veterans, Carroll and Barbone, and the two kids, Eastwick and McEnany. Fisk has been on both times. The home run in the second, then he drew a walk from Gary Nolan in the fourth inning. So the Reds' infield looks for the ground ball with one out and one on. Darcy having trouble finding the strike zone. Cincinnati five Boston one. Each club has had four hits but all four for Cincinnati have been extra base hits three homers and a triple. Strike to it. You look at this record of the Cincinnati team. 20 game winning margin 108 wins their fantastic home record yet they went 45 games in a row without a complete game. Sparky felt like that was a misleading figure, Kurt, because of the fact that he had such a deep, deep bullpen. Here's a check swing foul ball. Sparky Anderson and his philosophy in terms of pitching, he feels if he gets a good effort out of his starting pitcher for seven innings, if he can help it, he's not going to let him lose the ball game. It's pretty much the modern thinking all around now. And there go the batting averages because it <laughs> knocked off a few points with specialists, relief specialists, defensive specialists. Can't win without a good relief. Uh, not man, but a couple or three. It's been the salvation for the Cincinnati club, I'll tell you. Darcy ahead of the hitter. Misses low and inside to Fisk. Two and two now. In the inning, Doyle has popped out foul ground to Pete Rose, and Yastrzemski has drawn a walk. Now a timeout call by the right field foul line umpire, Nick Colosi. The ball apparently got loose out of the Cincinnati bullpen. Darcy taking his time. Perez playing off the bag and behind the runner at first, and now it's down in the dirt. It's a full count. So Pat Darcy rapidly pitching himself into a problematical situation in the sixth inning. And again, as we mentioned, he's not worked since the 27th of September, and certainly that could have something to do with his possible control problems. Another walk as he's given up back to backers to Yastrzemski and Fisk. Marty, is Johnny Ben still cutting the middle inside of his glove up when he gets the glove? Have you noticed that he does that? I don't think he's doing it anymore, Tony. I know he used to do it, but I don't believe he's doing it anymore. I don't know what the reasoning behind it was. A little bit looser, uh, able to bend it more because he has a one handed catcher, easier for him to break in. Sparky Anderson a little bit concerned right now in the Cincinnati dugout as Darcy has put a couple of runners on the easy way walks to Yastrzemski into fist. Here's Freddie Lynn and his ball one to him. You know, he made a great statement tonight. He, he said in Boston he'd never been treated as nice by an organization as the Red Sox. Of course I want to win the World Series. But we also want a great World Series. Ran the pitch in on him a call strike. This is our showcase. Told me the same thing earlier tonight. Kurt signing balls down in the Reds dressing room. He said, We want to win this series, but we want to promote baseball. Right under Jim Willoughby is going down to begin throwing for Boston as Lynn fouls the pitch back to the netting, and he's down to Darcy at one and two. And he had the pitch he wanted too, right in his wheelhouse. Little up and in. There's Willoughby. Quite a story for the Red Sox. Had a great streak helping them toward their Eastern Division Championship. Came up from Tulsa. Recommendation of Kenny Boyer. Runners leading at first and second base with one out. Lynn a foul strike off to the left and out of here. Kurt, I don't know that there's been a rookie for many, many years that has so dominated a league as Fred Lynn, of course, Jim Rice also. Well, Rice came strong the last two months. That one a bouncer that gets by Johnny Bench and both runners will advance. He scored a wild pitch. No chance. Johnny got down, tried to keep it in front, but the ball bounced way out in front. And when you get a breaking ball, it takes a little bit of spin and sometimes bounces away. 
Well, a big meeting on the mound right now. Pat Darcy will join there by Joe Morgan and shortstop Davy Concepcion as they talk it over. This has been all Darcy's doing with the two walks and now a wild pitch. Red Sox trailing by four runs, but a base hit here from Freddie Lynn could get him to within striking distance again. Sparky Anderson talking with his pitching coach, Larry Shepard. Clay Carroll continuing to heat in the Reds' pen. Well, he just did get a piece of the ball to stay alive. Looks like he's got a good natural sinker. That ball went down a lot. He does, Tony. This fastball simply explodes at home plate. When he's throwing the good hard stuff, he, he's got a good moving fastball. Outfield giving Lynn quite a bit of room in left center field. He went after a high pitch and hits it very high into left center. Foster, Geronimo, it's going to be Foster. Here's a tag at third. Here's a throw to the plate. And it'll not be in time. And the Red Sox are on the board for the second time tonight. I was surprised that Foster took it. There was plenty of time for Geronimo, who has the superior throwing arm, to come over and get in position. But Foster apparently waved him off. They have rated the two best throwing arms in this series, Geronimo and Evans. Tony, the point you just made, I would imagine, if you could look inside the head of Sparky Anderson, he's not too pleased with the fact that Foster caught that ball in left field for the very reason that you pointed out. I don't think Joe Morgan was either. He was looking out there from behind the pitching mound after it happened. This remaining at second base. Here's Petroselli, and again, Darcy throws one into the dirt. Here's just another one of the things Bench does so well is this and he blocks in the dirt. We've seen him scoop up a ball in a key situation in game number two, first and third, nobody out, and a throw from Concepcion. Darcy continuing to pitch from behind. The Boston hitters is two balls and no strikes to Petroselli. How about that play he made on the bunt at Fenway Park? Looked like a big cat out there that time. Two down in the inning, a run home for Boston, five to two, and there's a call strike. Matt Darcy, the man who stands to gain the win in this game, and that Gary Nolan, the starter, went only four innings. Three balls and a strike as he misses high with a fastball. Both bullpens are busy here in the Boston sixth inning. We got a look at third base coach Don Zimmer shouting out to the runner at second Fisk. Here's a bouncing ball charging Concepcion. And that's all for the Red Sox in the sixth inning. They get a run, no hits, a man left on. After five and a half innings of play in Cincinnati, it's the Reds five and the Red Sox two. Well, a lovely young lady right down there, as you see, and that's Mrs. Vicki Chesser Bench. Young South Carolina lady married to the Reds catcher Johnny Bench. That's her mom to her left and her dad to her right as they watch the action here. She's got to be a very happy young lady now and that her husband had a fourth inning home run that put the Reds out in front. And it's Johnny Bench leading off the bottom of the sixth inning for Cincinnati. That home run for Bench is third hit in the series. He's now gone three for ten and facing the right hander for the first time in the game. Reggie Cleveland the third Boston pitcher to be used by Darrell Johnson tonight starts Bench out with a breaking pitch. He checked his swing in time. Five runs on four hits for Cincinnati. They've certainly made the most of their base hits. And swings and misses at a pitch out away from him. Reggie Cleveland has a very important job now. Any middleman coming in with his team behind, he has to check that other club and allow nothing more and enable his club to try and creep back into the ball game. Eventually a foul ball off the very tip end of the bat. So he's behind at Cleveland. One ball and two strikes as Johnny Bench leads off the six with George Foster on deck. Again, Rick Burleson playing extremely deep. Johnny Bench, a dead pull hitter. Count even at 2-2. He had one home run during the regular season the other way, and I'll tell you, it was a real shocker to the fans here at Riverfront Stadium. Saw Tony and I saw him hit one here against Pittsburgh in the fifth game in 72 to the opposite field. 
Well, Cleveland has chalked up his second strikeout. He fanned Perez to end the fifth and now KO's Johnny Bench to begin the sixth inning. One away, and here's George Foster. He walked his first time up and then bounced out to Petroselli at third in the fourth inning. Mentioned earlier the fact that the back-to-back -back Reds home runs in the fifth inning was the seventh time in World Series history. That's been pulled off. But an interesting side note, it's a first ever by a National League club. Six time the American Leaguers have hit back-to-backers. First time by the National League. Here's a very high fly ball. Tracking it, the veteran Carl Yastrzemski. And they're two down quickly. Davey Concepcion now with two away and the base is empty for Cincinnati. Getting an especially big hand by the Reds crowds at Riverfront. He had a home run leading off the fifth. Don Zimmer was talking to Bench before the ball game about the great shortstops in the National League. They were comparing them. Boa, Metzger, Concepcion. And it seemed to see that the Concepcion came out on top all round. Here's a call strike to him. Tony as you well know being a former shortstop he's got tremendous range he's got a fine arm he's a heady type of ball player he knows the hitters very well in this league and you talk to Sparky Anderson and he said hey this kid hasn't reached his prime yet he's going to get better check swing foul Reggie Cleveland throwing strikes he's jumped out in front two strikes on Dave Concepcion I'll tell you one thing about Sparky John Ralston the Dale Carnegie a pro football. Sparky is Mr. Positive of baseball. I guess you have the kind of club he has. You can afford to be that way. Yes, sir. Seems to be a bit more relaxed right now. That's his favorite seat. When the Reds are hitting, he sits next to Ted Klazuski. And when the Reds are in the field, he moves over near his pitching coach, Larry Shepard. Ground ball the other way, scooped up by Cooper. He taps a bag and the Reds are meekly out one two three in their half of the sixth inning here three up three down at the end of six Reds over the Red Sox five to two. Well we have World Series game number seven we'll have a baseball football doubleheader this coming Sunday coverage beginning at 1230 with a baseball world of Joe Garagiola followed by the World Series game seven from Boston and then at four o'clock by three regional NFL football games. The highlight game of the day would be Oakland right here against the Cincinnati Bengals in Cincinnati. The World Series is completed. We'd have an NFL doubleheader. We'll tell you more about it right now again. Marty Brenneman. Thank you Kurt. Here's Dwight Evans leading off the seventh for Boston and the first pitch misses from Pat Darcy and while well, we've got activity in both bullpens. For the Boston Red Sox that's right hander Jim Willoughby throwing. Swung on a bouncing ball up the middle. Concepcion cannot get it. That is hit number five for the Boston Red Sox. Evans quickly coming back into first base as the throw goes that way. Here's Evans going nicely with the pitch. Concepcion was playing him a little bit up the middle. Another one of those, we've repeated it before, on artificial surface, scoots right on by him. That'll bring up Rick Burleson and Sparky Anderson on his way to the mound and before he ever reaches a first base foul line he signals that he wants a right hander Clay Carroll. So Clay Carroll will be coming on in a saving situation as Darcy heads back toward the Cincinnati dugout. Well, Rick Burleson was scheduled to bat for the Red Sox. He will be hitting. He goes back to the Boston dugout to confer with Carlton Fisk as Clay Carroll now reaches a Riverfront Stadium bow. Bernie Carbo has moved to the on deck circle. He's going to be the pinch hitter for the pitcher Reggie Cleveland. And while we're witnessing a game here tonight where we're seeing both managers go to their bullpens and go to them frequently. The Red Sox have used Wise, Burton and Cleveland. We'll be seeing another new Boston pitcher when the Reds bat in the seventh and now right under Clay Carroll known as a hawk here in Cincinnati becomes the third pitcher for the men of Sparky Anderson. Captain Hook's gone to work. That's what he's known around here as. We look at Clay Carroll from all angles. 
He's pretty much of a power pitcher. He has served mostly in relief up here in Cincinnati, although he has been a starter in some trouble times. Good sinking fastball, hard slider. He can come in and throw strikes, get you the ground balls and occasionally the strikeout. Here now in slow motion, Clay Carroll from Four Angles, Harry Coyle, our director who's been at almost every World Series, working hard to get all these different angles for you. The camera. 1903. Oh, 1903. <laughs> did they televise back then? If they did, Harry was here. <laughs> Clay Carroll ready to go to work now on Rick Burleson, and he gets the first pitch over for a taken strike. This is second game of this 1975 World Series. He did not record an out and coming on in relief of Don Gullett in game one Saturday at Fenway Park. And his 11th appearance lifetime in series competition. He's 0 and 2 with Burleson and again Bernie Carbo in the on deck circle to bat for pitcher Reggie Cleveland. And uh, with those left handers coming up Carbo followed by Cooper Doyle and Yastrzemski. The Reds have McEnany their left handed reliever warming up. Evans leading at first base nobody out. Trying to get him to go after a breaking ball out away from him but Burleson not having any of it. There's McEnany. Young man from Springfield Ohio just a few days ago became a father for the first time. The Red Sox trying to battle back. They're down by three big ones in the seventh. Swung on. That could be two. Morgan Concepcion Perez. And that is a highly underrated part of this total team the Cincinnati Reds have. Morgan and Concepcion you said it before but they just might be the best all around ever to play the game around second base and that takes in a lot of territory. They talk about the Reds power they set a major league record this year they played 15 consecutive games without making an error they had the fewest errors in their league. So they do it both ways what you have to do in any sport to win. Here's Bernie Carbo batting for Reggie Cleveland and this is somewhat of a homecoming of sorts and he hits one well back into left field Foster looking and it's out of here. That's a typical Carbo home run to the opposite field. He thought it was a ground rule double. <laughs> he thought it bounced did he? Come on Bertie. He hit his home runs at Crosley yeah. Field when he first came out. We know you're excited. You know he came out yesterday at the workout and stirred up a little controversy. He thought that he should be playing back here <laughs> in Cincinnati that Yastrzemski should go back to first base. He should be in left field. Yaz yeah, got a little bit irritated we understand with it. There's Foster going back. Marty Brenneman pointed out that yellow line as he went around the park early in the game just barely made it. He really has power to the opposite field for a left hander. Here comes Sparky Anderson again. He's wearing on a path from the dugout to the mound and he's going to bring on the left hander McEnany apparently to pitch to the left handed batting Cecil Cooper. Kurt you know it's amazing. We had two games in Boston. They talked about the green monster. No home runs, and now look what's happened here tonight. Well, that wind, I, I guess I talked a lot, a lot about it over the weekend, but I, I've seen so many times with that east wind, and that's where Johnny Bench may, we may look back. We don't know what's going to happen, and here are the Red Sox getting back into this one. So Johnny Bench showed me something Sunday with that wind blowing in against him. He went to the opposite field instead of trying to hit the wall. That was smart hitting. We have a break in the action. Another pitching change for the Reds and the score right now is Cincinnati 5 and Boston 3. Well, there you got to look at 23-year-old Will McEnany, 5-2 and two on the year for Cincinnati, and he led this club in appearances coming out of the Reds' bullpen a total of 70 times. He'll be working to the left-handed batting Cooper with two down. The pitch to him swung on, a jam job that he bloops into shallow left center, and that's the inning. For the Boston Red Sox in the seventh inning they get a run on a couple of hits the home run by Bernie Carbo and at the end of six and a half it's a Reds five and the Red Sox three. Another pitcher on for the Boston Red Sox as the Reds come calling in the seventh inning and it's going to be right hander Jim Willoughby. Willoughby spent some time in the National League he had a great streak where in about 12 or 14 appearances in relief he figured in a lot of big decisions something like 12 12 of them saves or wins but Daryl Johnson called Tulsa Oklahoma where Willoughby was pitching talked to an old friend Ken Boyer that if you got somebody down there who can help us you owe us a player 
from a deal they had made. And Boyer said, well, we've got a guy here who's pitched some games starting, has gotten 20 ground ball outs. Harold you know, Johnson said, that's what I need, a man who can come in, get a right-handed hitter out and get me the double play. And he sent Jim Willoughby. He's a sinker baller. He was pitching overhand at one time, and I found out when he dropped down, he's much more effective. His, he'll have a natural sinker ball when he throws that ball sidearm. He's tough on right-handers. Going to be facing eight, nine, and one in the Cincinnati half of the seventh inning. Geronimo, who had the back end of those back-to-back -back home runs for the Reds in the fifth inning. Concepcion let it off with a home run to left center, and then Geronimo played long ball to right. Willoughby becomes pitcher number four for Boston. Geronimo takes strike one. Red Sox not out of this game by a long shot. They trail five to one at one point. They have scored a couple of runs. We have witnessed a total of five home runs in this game. Three by Cincinnati and two by Boston. There's McEnany on deck. Nobody throwing in the Reds bullpen, which would indicate that McEnany will hit for himself. Reggie Cleveland did an outstanding job retiring four batters in a row before he faced. There's a fly ball hit well to center field. But that, of course, the deepest part of the park, and Lynn has no trouble with it. Kurt, you saw Joe DiMaggio, Dominic DiMaggio. They always talk about Joe gliding back. We just saw Freddie Lynn glide back. What kind of comparison is there? Well, I saw Joe DiMaggio, you know, in the twilight of his career when he was... 32, 33 years old. You can see that fluid grace still there, but not the way it was when he was a young player. Lynn is deceptive like Joe, though. He sort of glides after the ball, long strides. Packard, and he takes the first pitch away from him, and Boston pitching has now retired a total of six batters in a row. Griffey reaching on a walk in the fifth inning, and he's been the last Cincinnati base runner. One ball and one strike. Let me tell you, the little brother wasn't bad out there in mm. center field, a little professor. <laughs> He got everything and threw well. They all three are outstanding. There's a chopper over the mound. That's going to be played by Doyle back in second. And the ball is mishandled by Cooper. It appeared to be a throw down in the dirt from Jenny Doyle, and Cooper could not make the pickup. And they're trying to win the third World Series game. They go to work early here, Kurt. They sure do. Comes with a fastball, and now well, McEnany had Lynn down 0-2. It's now two balls and two strikes as Will requests and gets a new baseball. On deck for the Boston Red Sox, third baseman Rico Petroselli. He'll be followed by the right fielder Dwight Evans. Now the 2-2 pitch. Strike three is called. That was a drop. Very sharp breaking curveball that gets Lynn. He had no chance on that. Perfect spot. Watch it. He's just overmatched on that pitch. You can see him start pulling out, pulling away, looking for something inside. Great pitch. McEnany and Eastwood remind me a lot of Mossy and Narleski in the 50s when they came up with Cleveland. Here's a base hit to center field by Rico Petroselli, who continues to swing a very, very potent bat for the Red Sox in this series. Now we got the tying run coming up with the left-hander to face the right-hander. Comes Sparky. We pause briefly for station identification. This is the NBC television network. Sparky Anderson, a busy man, going from dugout to pitcher's mound tonight, is once again sending down the call, and this time it's going to be right-hander Raleigh Eastwood. McEnany giving up a one-out single to center by Rico Petroselli, and as Tony mentioned, that brings a tie and run to the plate. Batter will be Dwight Evans when we get back to the action. Well, we'd like to pass along our thanks tonight to statistician Alan Roth, our production stage manager Jim O'Gorman, and our field supervisor Huey McDermott. Sparky Anderson trying to get a very, very emphatic point across to Raleigh Eastwick, and this young man having won a game already the Sunday game at Fenway now comes on to try and save this one and well rightly so as far as the Reds are concerned because as Curtin Tony pointed out earlier tonight it has been McEnany and it has been this young man from Haddonfield New Jersey who have proven to be the salvation for this Reds bullpen and in the Red Sox dugout are mostly right handed uh, batters to pinch it Doug Griffin Bob Heise 
They do have one left-hander, Rick Miller, Juan Benicas. Sparky Anderson doesn't miss many chicks. As he talked to Eastwick after he left the mound, he looked over to Tony Perez, say, play behind the runner at first. He looked out to his outfield and motioned them to play a little deeper to prevent an extra base hit to keep that tying run out of scoring position. Eastwick, I think, primarily a power pitcher, slider, and fastball. Tomorrow night at 8 o'clock Eastern Time, World Series game number four from Cincinnati. El Tiante against the brilliant young left-hander, Don Gullett, preceded by the baseball world of Joe Garagiola. Joe's show tomorrow night, Foster Brooks, and a different kind of baseball story. Joe's told me about it, and it's going to be some show. We've got a show right now here in the ninth now. That we do. Eastwick is all set to go to work to Evans. Joe Morgan coming quickly in from second base to have a word with him. I forgot about the switch hitter, Blackwell, in the dugout of the Red Sox. Petroselli at first. The man at the plate is Dwight Evans, and he represents the tying run. It's five to three Reds. As Boston now has out hit Cincinnati seven to five, and Pedro Bourbon, a right-hander, picks up where Eastwick left off. Evans one for three. Pitch. That's low a ball. There's Bourbon. Sparky's got a pitcher for every batter. <laughs> I'll tell you, he's used just about everybody with the exception of Bourbon, Kurt. Fred Norman expected to be utilized as a reliever in the series, but he has not thrown tonight. Here's a fly ball hit into left field. Foster back on the warning track, and he will not get it. It's a home run and a tie ball game. Raleigh Eastwick has just given up a game-tying ninth-inning home run to Dwight Evans. As the Red Sox dugout erupts, they have tied it up at 5 all. And we've just had an all-time World Series record tied. Six home runs, three by each team tonight. The Red Sox made quite a comeback. Cleveland and Willoughby kept them in the ballgame with their relief pitching. They were trailing 5-1, to one, and now they've tied it. Evans wasn't sure. He ran hard all the way to first base. It was hit so high, and after he hit the bag, what a jump from jubilation he gave. Now it's Rick Burleson at the plate. One hit and three times up. A ball to him. Boston dugout just now settling down as they welcomed Evans in. One ball and one strike as Eastwick comes with fire to the Boston shortstop. That was a clutch home run right there, folks. Mm. Foster still thought he had a chance as we look at Dwight Evans home run again. There he gives up a little despair as he presses that wall. Two runs across for the Red Sox to tie it up. Here's a fly ball into shallow center. Morgan back. He cannot get it. Morgan trying to play it all the way ranging back into shallow center field but Burleson dumps it in. And now the Red Sox have the go ahead run on. And the pitcher Jim Willoughby getting a word as he heads toward the plate from third base coach Don Zimmer. He's probably telling Willoughby if the bunt is on which direction to bunt it, Rose will be charging hard at third. It's difficult to bunt an artificial service because the ball gets to the infielder so fast. The place you'd like to go is to the first baseman Perez because he's got the hole the runner Burleson on. Now well, Pete Rose. Playing in shallow at third base as Willoughby is up in a bunt situation. Tony Perez charging. Throw that first base, but not in time. As Morgan snuck in behind the runner, and they almost had him. What a snap throw by Bench. He the, rifled that one. The set play, a time play. Joe Morgan started going right off the bat. Here he comes, right behind the runner, Burleson. Burleson, a very alert base runner. A lot of guys might have gotten picked off on that. The Red Sox getting a two run homer from Evans to tie it up and now trying to get the go ahead run around. Burleson at first base one out. The 1 0 to Willoughby. But at first base side, it's a good one. Tony Perez will have to throw on to Morgan covering for the out on a sacrifice bunt as Willoughby does his job. Look at Pete Rose on that last bunt. By the time the bat is on the ball, he's 10 feet away from Willoughby, the pitcher. Willoughby with an exceptional bunt on this artificial surface. Now look at look at Johnny say knock it down. You can see him directing traffic back at home plate. 
Raleigh Eastwick and the Reds involved in a pressure cooker situation as Roger Moret goes back to begin throwing in the Red Sox bullpen. 5 5 tie. Go ahead, run at second base in the ninth inning with two out. And Cooper with a pop up back of the plate, but Bench will not have a play on it. It's no difference a Red Sox fan, a Reds fan. This has been some kind of ball game. Mm. Boston led 1 0. The Reds went out in front 5 to 1, and boy, credit the Red Sox. They have battled back. Low and inside. One ball on the strike. Well, the Reds have come back, I think, what, over 40 times this year to win games. The Red Sox have done the same thing. You don't win a league championship without doing that. Eastwick trying to get the third out. Checks Burleson at second. Cooper with a foul back. Cooper, one of four 300 hitters for the Red Sox this season. He batted 311. There is Darrell Johnson. Right alongside is catcher Carlton Fisk as they watch the action. Moret has been joined in the Red Sox bullpen by a right-hander, Dick Drago. See Drago on the left, Moret on the right. Another foul ball as Eastwick continues to throw strikes and Cooper fouls him away. Holding count, a ball and two strikes. Some pretty good arms in the outfield for Burleson to challenge off second base on the event of a base hit to the infield. Geronimo leading the pack. Maybe in all of baseball with that strong, accurate throwing arm. Another check swing foul ball by Cooper. He's headless and four times up tonight, has grounded out twice, has popped to the infield and hit a fly ball to left. Start thinking about the Cincinnati ninth inning. They're going to have Bench, Foster, and Concepcion coming to the plate. 5 5 lockup. One and two pitch. Swung on. Fly ball. Shallow center. Geronimo. He's got it. The side retired. A ninth inning that ties it up for the Red Sox. Two runs on three hits with a man left on. We go to the bottom of the ninth. Reds five. Boston five. Well, we're into sudden death. The bottom of the ninth inning in a five to five ball game. And Jim Willoughby, who has pitched outstanding ball in relief for Boston. In fact, the Reds over the last three innings have had only one hit, and that came from, of all people, Will McEnany, an infield hit off of Willoughby in the seventh inning. The Red Sox have Drago, a right-hander, a fastball pitcher. Moret has an outstanding arm. He's a left-hander. And here's Johnny Bench to lead it off. There you see in the upper right-hand corner of your screen, Johnny's wife, Vicki, along with her parents, is... Johnny leads off the ninth inning. He's had one of the three Cincinnati home runs. A blast off starter Wick rides in the fourth inning with a man on. Willoughby delivers. Then swings and he misses. Still has two more, Mom. Nobody throwing in the Cincinnati bullpen. As Kurt mentioned, two working for Boston. There's a bouncing ball foul off the third baseline. The Cincinnati bullpen that has been so ballyhooed in this World Series, but I'll tell you, Boston's bullpen has simply been outstanding tonight. Nothing in two. Jim Willoughby against Johnny Bench. Ground ball third. There's Petroselli eating it up. I'll tell you, he's been amazing in this series. He's done it all with a bat, with a glove. He has an inner ear problem. And he almost has threatened to retire. He's been ill the last month, but he looks like he's 22 years old the way he's played in this series. That was a tougher play than it looked because he was right on the line protecting against the double. Had a long way to go to his left. That ball hit that area you described earlier, right around that seam near the dirt park. Here's a guy who can hit him a long way, George Foster. 23 home runs during the season. Hitless in two times up tonight has walked. One. We know Willoughby so far has had it because they're hitting the ball on the ground. Only one man has hit the ball in the air against him. He's got that sinker ball. They're beating it down. On deck for Cincinnati, David Concepcion. Bottom out of the ninth inning with one man out of the base is empty, a 5 5 score. Burleson will play it from deep in the hole at shortstop. Uh oh. 
And a nice play by Cecil Cooper as he oh. saw that ball was going to take a hop, backed up, but still stayed on the bag to make the play on it and retire Foster. He's got a good arm. Luckily, he had the artificial surface to skip the ball off. Cooper makes a super play, backing off on the ball. He had he stretched, he'd gotten a funny hop. Burleson usually will throw you out on a fly on that one. He has a very deceiving arm, strong arm, the little rooster. So Jim Willoughby and out away from sending this game into extra innings. He has retired Bench and Foster on ground balls to the left side, and here's Concepcion. He homered in the fifth inning. Ground ball, easy pop for Petroselli. And that's all for the Reds as they go out meekly. One, two, three in the ninth inning. Three up, three down. And at the end of nine complete, it's the Reds five and the Red Sox five. It appeared in the fifth inning that the Reds were going to bomb the Red Sox out of Riverfront Stadium when they took a five to one lead. They had back to back homers by Concepcion and Geronimo to increase their lead to four to one. And then Rose hit a triple off Rick Wise. He came in to score on a sacrifice fly by Morgan to make it five to one. And then what a superlative job. Reggie Cleveland. He retired four in a row, middle innings. Willoughby has allowed only one man to reach base the last three innings. They kept the Red Sox in it by checking the Reds completely, and the Red Sox went to work with a run in the sixth, a run in the seventh, and a two-run homer by Dwight Evans in the ninth to tie it. So we're going to the tenth inning. Five runs, nine hits, one error for the Red Sox. Five runs, five hits, no errors for the Reds. Doyle, Yastrzemski, and Fisk facing Raleigh Eastwood. The strike to Doyle, who's gone hitless in four times. Cooper, at the top of the order, went hitless in five. 0 for 9, the number one and two men in the Red Sox lineup. And yet they still tied this game. Strike two. And Yastrzemski's failed to hit. The hitting by the Red Sox has been down at the bottom of the order. Two strikes. Foul ball into the seats down the left field line. Nolan, Darcy, Carroll, McEnany, Eastwick. Here we are now with pitcher facing batter from two shots. All the way on the left, a study on the right. One ball, two strikes. Doyle leading off the 10th. Ooh, that was just outside. Two balls, two strikes. Bench thought they had the corner. A 2 2 pitch to Denny Doyle. Three and two. Perez right on top of that first baseline. Down at first. The 3 2 delivery. Bounding ball up the middle over for Morgan. No play. He wisely held on to it. He wasn't going to take any chance of a bad throw, an out balanced throw. And Doyle battled back from a two strike count. That's the tenth hit for the Red Sox. Watch Morgan give way. He knows that Concepcion is the only one who has a chance to make a play. He just backed off. David, with exceptional speed, just couldn't get it on the high hopper on the artificial surface. The Red Sox have out hit the Reds double now, 10 to 5. Of the five Red hits, three have been homers and one triple. Yastrzemski rounded out twice, walked, and struck out. And Borbone goes to work in the Cincinnati bullpen. High to Yastrzemski. A right-hander's on deck, Carlton Fisk. We're all tied, five up, 10th inning. You never know, do you? The Reds did it in Boston in the ninth. Now the Red Sox battle back tonight here when they look like they're out of it. Ball two to Yastrzemski. And the Cincinnati crowd is very uneasy right now. Two old pitch to Yastrzemski. He hits a drive into deep center, way back. Geronimo right up against the wall. A couple of feet higher, and the 
Reds were in real trouble. Geronimo gauged that one perfectly. Yastrzemski got his pitch, and he really leaned into it. Here's Geronimo displaying a great knowledge of his home park, going back very nicely, knowing when he hit that warning track, when he had to jump. He is a superlative center fielder, and I guess for a number of years, boys, we're going to hear who's better. Geronimo, Lynn, throwing a few others, too, I guess. Carlton Fisk homered in a second, nobody on. Walked twice, grounded out, bench to Perez. He's one out of two officially. One down, Doyle at first. We see it again, the catch by Geronimo, and as Tony says, he knows this ballpark like he knows the palm of his hand. He knew how much room he had. He made a little leap at the last second to bring it down, and the thing about this man is that he does things so effortlessly that a lot of people feel like he does not get the credit he deserves. The 1-0 pitch, a strike, a fastball to Carlton Fisk, 1-1. One one. Red Lynn is on deck for the Red Sox. Geronimo is playing Fisk straight away. Foster's more toward the line, and Morgan is shading second. Two balls and a strike to Carlton Fisk. That's Geronimo. A lot of clubs in the American League will play Fisk over more toward left center field, so maybe they're going to try to keep the ball away, get him to hit the ball to center field. The 2 1 pitch, runner going, hit and run on, down to Morgan. Tag, throw, double play. The great part about this is that Morgan does not allow himself to get in the way of Doyle where he could have gotten upset and would not have been able to make that last throw to get the front end of that double play. Here it is again as the batter Fisk hits the ball on the ground and perfectly played as the runner goes. Morgan was heading toward the bag. He fielded the ball, tagged the runner sliding Doyle and got the easy double play of Fisk at first base. So now Jim Willoughby comes out in the last of the 10th inning. And he'll face Geronimo Eastwick, the pitcher, if they let him hit, and Pete Rose at the top of the order. Now, this coming Sunday, we'll have a big sports double header for you. If we have uh, Game 7 of the World Series in Boston, we would have the baseball world of Joe Garagiola at 1230, and the uh, baseball game followed by football with a feature game. The Oakland Raiders trying to bounce back from their stunning defeat last week by Kansas City against the undefeated Cincinnati Bengals. If the World Series is over, the lineup would be grandstand, then re regional football at 1 o'clock, Baltimore, New England, Miami and the Jets, that'll be a great one in New York, and the 4 o'clock games, Cleveland against Denver, Kansas City, San Diego, well, the Oakland-Cincinnati game going across most of the country, and grandstand again. Either way, you're the winners, whatever happens on Sunday on NBC. Jim Willoughby's had an excellent sinker ball tonight. In the last two innings, eighth and ninth, he's got five ground balls out, all outs out of six. But he's had his trouble second and third times around facing hitters because they start laying off the pitch that is between the knees and the ankles. They force him to get behind. Then he has to come up with the ball and he gets hurt. Cesar Geronimo will start it off for Cincinnati in the last of the 10th inning. Give him a good hand for the catch. <laughs> Sit and watch ball games year after year. That Terry Crowley coming out on deck. Left-handed batter. Bounce foul. How many times when that player makes a great play in the field does he come in to lead off the inning? A left-handed pinch hitter, Crowley, will be up next. Cincinnati trying to get that rhythmic clap going for a rally. They had a 5-1 lead at one time. There's a strike in the inside corner. And Willoughby jumps ahead of him 0-2. Drago and Moret, right-hander, left-hander. All heated up and ready in the Boston bullpen. They're deep for Geronimo. Willoughby just missing. Rago, the right-hander. Marev, the left-hander.
One ball, two strikes to Geronimo. Hard ground ball, base hit at the center field. The Reds have the winning run on. Crowley was on deck, but now Sparky is going to his good butter. He's done this before during the season, I believe, Marty. He's going to Ed Armbrister, who's an excellent butter. Saves him a left-handed pitch hitter by doing this. Ed Armbrister will bat for Raleigh Eastwick. And the winning run is on for Cincinnati in the last of the 10th inning. We're tied 5-all. In extra inning games this season, the Reds won 11 out of 15, and the Red Sox won 8 out of 12. They're both tough in extra innings. Well, the Red Sox know this man's a good bunner. Petroselli's in tight at third. Cooper will be charging. The outfield straight away, not too deep. Willoughby makes the move. Had three steals tonight by the Reds. Foster, Perez, Griffey outside. Geronimo is a good base runner. He stole 13 out of 18 this year. Kurt, he's another one that Joe Morgan is hoping to work extensively with in spring training to try and increase his base stealing production, as with Ken Griffey. Arm Brister hit a sacrifice fly. Tenth inning in the final game at Pittsburgh in the National League playoffs to provide the winning run. Throw to second. High. By Carl Smith over to third. Safe. We are going to have that a second. We're going to have an argument. They may reverse this decision. The Red Sox are arguing. Interference at the plate. They are saying that a batter after bunting interfered with Carl Smith, the catcher, in fair territory. He has to give room to Carl Smith so he can make the play. There's Daryl Johnson, Rico Petrocelli. Apparently, home plate umpire Larry Barnett is not going to reverse his decision. He might, he might ask for help for somebody else. One of the other umpires who they feel might have had a better look. Well, let's wait and see what happens. That's what Daryl Johnson wants. He's calling first base umpire Dick Stello right now. Tony and Marty, is that a gamble play of second by Fisk? Absolutely, Kurt. And. Uh... Well, I'll tell you, to be honest about it, Tony, I don't know how you feel, but he may well have a valid argument, both Carlton Fisk and Daryl Johnson. Daryl Johnson right now is saying, I want to hear from Dick Stella, but apparently Larry Barnett is saying, no, I made the call, I'm sticking with it. Daryl Johnson saying, he interfered with my man, my catcher, Carlton Fisk, in fair territory. And we're going to look at it again and see what we've got. Here is the butt with Geronimo on first. Watch this now. Fisk has got to have room. Armbrister right in his way. I have got to say right there, he interfered with him. I'd agree with you, Tony. Let's look at it again as we re-rack it. Daryl Johnson still wants an appeal to Stella or somebody else. Barnett saying, uh-uh. I made the call. It's going to stand as it is. Runners on second and third. Nobody out. Well, right so. now, things look pretty hopeless. Here it is again. Armbrister making sure the butt is down right is in Fisk's way. Barnett is blocked out on the play. You can see he was blocked by Armbrister. Boy, that's Fisk time. I don't blame him. After you saw him had to throw over the batter, he knew a fast man was going, and he still tried to get him a second base. The throw skipped into center field. Kurt, a big, a big, big break for Cincinnati in a play that is destined to go down as a very, very controversial call on the part of Larry Barnett. And an error has been charged to Fisk. Mm. He's made two errors in this game. On throws the second. Here's another angle, Tony. Here's another angle. Watch Fisk, watch Armbrister. There's Fisk. The ball is in fair territory. Armbrister is definitely in his way, and I believe, Kurt, the rule reads that you cannot obstruct, impede, get in the way of a fielder, a lot of other terminology, in fair territory. You've got to give the ground to the fielder. Offensive interference. Defensive interference is an act by a fielder which hinders or prevents a batter from hitting a pitch. 
offensive interference, which interferes with, obstructs, impedes, hinders, or confuses any fielder attempting to make a play. Impedes, obstructs, hinders, or confuses any fielder attempting to make a play. If the umpire declares a batter, batter runner, or a runner out for interference, all other runners shall return to the last base that was. The judgment of the umpire legally touched at the time of interference. Kurt and Marty, it looked to me, there's the commissioner of baseball, Boy Q, talking to former American League president Joe Cronin, Hank Aaron right behind the commissioner, but it appeared to me that Armbrister did three or four of those things, interfere, impede, obstruct, <laughs> call it what you want, but he was in the way. Hank Aaron wasn't getting into the uh, <laughs> conversation. He says, let him play ball. Well, this changes the whole strategy now. This throw was to try to nap Geronimo at second and went into center field. So Geronimo is the winning run now at third. Armbrister went to second. An error charged. The sacrifice and an error charged against Fisk. And now Roger Moret is on. Pete Rose is the next batter. They have first base open. Rose is a switch hitter. And following him is a left-hander, Griffey. Two errors by Fisk in this game ties a series record for a catcher three times previously. The irony of that is that Carlton Fish shouldn't have any errors. That throw he made to second base earlier might have been handled by Denny Doyle. And this one right here, well, we saw it. It'll be interesting in the post-game analysis if the score stands up, Cincinnati scores. If Larry Barnett, the home plate umpire, says he made the decision all by himself, he might have gotten blocked out from our camera angle, or if he did, appeal to Dick Stella or another umpire on the bases for help. All right, the Reds. Now have a great chance. Pete Rose is up. And uh, Fist looks to the dugout. They've got to walk him. They're going to put him on and hope for a force out at home or a force double play starting at home. The outfield will come in. Long fly will win the game anyway. The infield will be in. This will load the bases with nobody out in the last of the 10th inning. And a play that I believe will go down as one of those controversial plays that you talk about for years to come in a World Series. As I recall, a World Series here not too many years ago, there was another controversial play at home plate involving Bernie Carbo when Kenny Burkhart was bumped, I believe, on the play. Some said he couldn't see it well, but he made a controversial decision. We're moving him in in the outfield. Way in. Merv Rettman now has come out. He's going to bat for Griffey. Yep. Sparky going with the percentages. Merv Rettman will hit for Griffey. Rettman's a right-hander. The outfield very, very shallow. All Rettman's got to do is do something. The Red Sox now will try and choke off Geronimo at the plate. Five to five, last of the tenth inning. Be a lot of arguing about that bunt by Armbrister. Did he interfere with Carlton's Fisk attempt to make a play? That's what the Red Sox were arguing about. That Fisk was interfered with. Brett fires a strike. He's a strikeout pitcher. He's got great stuff. He's not much of a ground ball pitcher. His fastball rides high most of the time, high and away, and they hit fly balls off in the right and left center field. One strike. He has a very, an outstanding fastball and a good curve. 114 and lost three this year. He was both a reliever and a starter. He's never been in a tougher jam than this with bases loaded, nobody out. Last of the 10th inning, World Series game number three. The Reds at one time leading five to one. Red Sox came back to tie it on Dwight Evans homer in the ninth. Strike two to Merv Rettman. Oh and two. Well, Helio Moret. In Puerto Rico. 6'4, 175 pounder. Willowy. Now the two strike pitch. Just a piece of it by Rettman. He won some big ball games in July and August with that fastball. Here's the pitch. He tried to blow it by Rettman high and tight. Just got a piece of it. Then after that pitch, a conference on the mound. Moret 
and Fisk as we look at Sparky looking over who Daryl Johnson's got left and a little scouting report also. He's got the book, huh? Moret's only 26, just turned 26. He's going over the hitters, it looks like, with Eastwick in case they have to go back out there. A two-strike delivery to Merv Rettman. High and away. The infield in, the outfield in. Bases are loaded. Nobody out for the Reds in the last of the tenth. Geronimo started with a single. Armbruster trying to bunt. Fist trying to field the bunt. Scrambled up at home plate. Fist threw the ball in the center field to set all this up. Curve is low. Two and two count. Fist and the entire Red Sox team raging that Fist was interfered with. This is a good block by Fisk behind the plate. Fitz has done this a couple times tonight, getting down, keeping the ball in front of him. We see Fisk do it now. Look at Rettenman hanging tough following that breaking pitch down. Two and two count. Bases loaded, nobody out. Five to five, last of the ten. Struck him out with a fastball. Rettman caught looking. He had something on that one. Now there's one out with a base loaded. And Joe Morgan, the batter. The outfield still has to play shallow. And the infield in. Three. If he did hit the ball on the ground, he's a tough man to double up. He had to go catch it at first. Now, Daryl Johnson trying to get the attention of one of his players. Three fine throwing outfield arms led by Dwight Evans and Wright. And they're all accurate arms. This is a job, though, where a pitcher almost has to do it himself. One down, base and loaded. Five to five tied. Curveball missing. One and oh to Joe Morgan. The Reds. There's the winning run, potential winning run, Geronimo. That's Arm Brisker at second. Pete Rose at first. One ball, no strikes. To Joe Morgan. He had him going on that curve, one and one. I think Joe said, hey, that was, that was quite a curveball. Scouting report didn't tell me about that one. <laughs> He's noted for his fastball. Roger Moretta in the toughest situation he's ever been called for. That's a high pop foul coming back out of play. And now Moretta's ahead of Morgan. One ball, two strikes. He came in here with the bases loaded, nobody out, and struck out pinch hitter Rettman. Now they're waving. They're trying to get uh, Evans. Evans in. They say you can't throw out Geronimo that deep. Get in there, even though you've got a fine arm. They wave him in shallower. That way he can catch a little looping line drive or a little blooper. Still have a chance at home plate. One ball, two strikes to Joe Morgan. They get credit for only one run batted in, and the Reds win it six to five. Joe Morgan getting credit for a single and a run batted in. Well, he drove in two runs tonight, and what a game we had! And we'll have controversy after this one over the bunt by Armbrister in front of the catcher Carlton Fitz. Final score six to five, Cincinnati. Game three of the 75 World Series has been brought to you by...